was a great team effort from literally everyone involved um, sure. to, you know, educate themselves on this new innovative, you know, product or portion of the capital stack that yep. most most people didn't know existed. Um, everyone approached it with, with an open mind. I think that was part of it. You know, there was lenders out there who just didn't want to learn about it. Um, they've been making loans a certain way, not really open to certain structures, and it was a non-starter for them. Um, but like as a lender, you know, it, I, I I always tell you know lenders who I speak with, you know, if you if you can become you know educated on it and learn how to use it in your capital stack when you're offering whole loan solutions to borrowers, you can become extremely competitive and win deals that you otherwise probably normally couldn't do. Um, we'll yeah, I mean, tell you boy, is that accurate? Yeah. Welcome to the C-Pace Confidential, where you'll hear about the hottest happenings in the world of C-Pace, commercial real estate, and beyond. We speak with the top players doing the most exciting projects and discover just how C-Pace has evolved into one of the most innovative financing options in the industry and how you can use C-Pace to be more successful in your business today. Now here's your host, the C-Pace guy, Adam Lipkin. All right, all right. Hey, everybody. How are you doing this morning? Welcome to the CPACE Confidential. I'm your host, Adam Lipkin, the CPACE guy. Got such an exciting show in store for you today. I'm, I'm really so uh, so thrilled to have my guest on. I'm going to bring him on in just a few minutes. But let's just get started with some of the big news happening in commercial real estate, also in the CPACE world. So top of the list, we heard the big news yesterday, Cushman Wakefield, strategic joint venture with Greystone, Wow. Absolutely unbelievable. So excited to see what the future looks like. I think there's a real buzz in the industry. A lot of the feedback I had heard was makes sense, you know, really being able to complement in so many ways. And, uh, and in the words of the chairman and CEO, Steven Rosenberg, on a scale of one to 10, how excited is everybody on it? 15. 15. So excited about the uh, the future for that uh, venture. So in the world of CPACE, Probably the big news is New York City came online several months ago, but everybody was waiting for new construction to be active. It initially came online with making CPACE available for existing buildings, which is great. And that's where there's going to be so much activity. We're going to be talking about one of those scenarios during this episode. But everybody wanted to see it available. There was an anticipation that was going to happen. Uh, New York State had that available as uh, you know that amendment happened and made it available throughout the state and markets where CPACE was live. Uh, and it went into effect just recently in the city. So now definitely something to consider CPACE for new construction, new development, um, you know, throughout the uh, the uh, city. And uh, and then just want to give a little bit of a plug to Commercial Observer. Had such an awesome experience for an event that they put on last week in Miami called the Future Forward. Probably one of the most thoughtful um, events that I've been to in terms of just future insights and trends and, you know, a lot of what's, um, you know, coming down the pike. Uh, highly recommend taking a look at it. Google search commercial observer future forward. And also on LinkedIn, you could type that into the search. Uh, there's some really great um, posts about it. Some of the sessions that were pretty big highlights. One in particular, just I wanted to bring up fast, uh, was there was a session with uh, Sandeep uh, from WeWork, CEO, and talked a little bit about uh, what they're seeing uh, in the pike. I mean, WeWork, what a story. You know, some of us don't realize, but uh, they went public actually, right? <laughs> Just recently this week. Uh, when you think about where it was two years ago, it was all the fanfare, kind of, you know, people like maybe didn't realize some of how the amazing success they've been experiencing is now translating. But one stat that I thought was really interesting that I just want to share was Sandeep was sharing. They just came off of best quarter yet. In the third, they leased 9.2 million square feet in Q3. Unbelievable. I mean, I don't think there's an office landlord who did that much in the quarter. And the other thing that I found really interesting was a disproportionate share of the leasing. Uh, with 1% of the space, they had about 30% of the leasing activity. So uh, certainly seeing, you know, it's obviously a little bit of a, you know, you know, a non-normalized conditions where people are, you know, just coming in in different arrangements, maybe taking on, you know, more shorter term leases, six, 12 months, 18, 24 months. But uh, we think that this arrangement is just going to continue to grow. And he was talking about that. Let's ditch the word hybrid. Let's talk about intentional flex. And that it really seems like we're moving into this type of uh, both environment where there's going to be people in the office. There are going to be people at home. There's going to be like arrangements where people are coming in several days a week, uh, coming in maybe less in some cases. But uh, it really seems like this is going to be an evolution of uh, of the office market. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in this episode. And so, um, you know, with no further ado, you know, I, I'm really so thrilled to be able to bring on my guest, uh, 
you know, I uh, I think everybody has heard a little bit about this major project that um, hit the press several months ago, 111 Wall Street with uh, Nightingale and uh, Ellie and the team, you know, from uh, Wafra and uh, just, you know, hearing a little bit more about the plans for it. Uh, but we're going to bring on Will Hun, who's uh, Director of Acquisitions and Investments with uh, Nightingale. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a little bit more into his background and uh, hear a little bit more about the project. So, Will, how are you, my man? Good to uh, have good, you on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Really thrilled. Uh, really so exciting to be able to get into this with you. So um, I thought, why don't we just kick it off? I, I'd love to be able to, you know, just have you share a little bit about your background. I mean, I, I love the story. You've, you've seen so much in a, in a pretty quick time, been really just involved with some of the most exciting projects. And so um, why don't you just take a few minutes and share a little bit about, you know, background story, origin, where you, you know, born and raised, and then a little bit how you joined up with Nightingale and maybe a couple of the projects before we jump into 111. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I am originally from Wichita, Kansas, middle of nowhere. Um, interesting story growing up. My parents always told me I had to get out of Kansas and not to come back and to go to the big city. Um, I had my break. Like, to I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I had uh, my chance to do that uh, when I got into Cornell University. I, I studied real estate at Cornell. Um, and then, you know, as with everyone, a lot, of, a lot of people who go there, we all kind of ended up in New York afterwards um and stayed in new york um had a tremendous real estate education from cornell it was one of the unique uh you know undergraduate programs that has they offer master level coursework to you know, undergraduate students um so i had a you know fairly good you know or well-informed start from there um i started my career in the just distressed real estate space um so i was predominantly buying REOs and distress nodes that were the fallout of the GFC. So call it 06 to 08 originations. It wasn't much in originations in 08, probably more 06, 07 before the fall of Lehman. Um, that's kind of how I cut my teeth in the business. I was literally buying properties that people were handing the keys back to the bank. And the business plan was figure out what's wrong with them and fix those problems and add the value and sell them as quickly as possible. That was probably the best education I could have ever asked for because it was real deal seasoning with uh, some of the hairiest product that, you know, that's out there in the market. I mean, it was, you know, CMBS loans that borrowers weren't even willing to work out. They're like, take the keys. You know, if I'm going to send the keys via UPS instead of FedEx because, you know, I want to save save on shipping. Uh, hey, well, let me just let me just stop for just one second, because I, I think there's there's such like unbelievable insight in how you just see things. If there's like any one takeaway that maybe came from that looking in retrospect and saying, wow, I really started to see things in a new way. And any big highlights seeing these like just really hairy deals, jumping in, figuring it out and anything that you kind of, you know, realize, like I, I started to see things and expanded the way I, um, you know, view situations. Curious about that. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, the reason why I say it was, it was the best education for me was, you know, a lot of these properties didn't go REO or the keys didn't go back to the bank um, because they were over levered. Um, yes, a handful were over levered, um, but a lot of it was because there was identifiable flaws um, that you can point out. Um, you know, it was a 50% occupied office building that 100% of the parking spots were leased out to the to the tenant that leased 50% of the office building. So you want, you want to go lease up the vacancy, but you have no parking to offer, you know, the balance of the vacancy in a suburban office setting. You're not going to be able to fix that problem. Um, so what I always say is if you see upside or see a problem, um, try to understand why it's a problem and if it's, yeah. if it's a solution that, that you can fix. A parking problem like that, you can't fix. Um, and, and for a suburban office, that's extremely important. Sure. Um, so, you know, small, small items like that. Got it. Got it. All right. So, let, yeah, let's keep going with it. So you, so you saw some of these, like, just really hairy situations. Cut your teeth. Fast forward. You know, maybe talk a little bit about how uh, Nightingale, in that stage of uh, your life, that chapter got started. Yeah. So I, I have known uh, Ellie through the years, through... Um, through friends that knew him in the community. And, you know, he's, he's a younger guy and wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, looking to grow a team, but more or less kind of convinced him. Um, you know, I have the tools to help him grow his business. And, you know, I've been, you know, 
it's been a pleasure to work with them for five years and we've grown the company, you know, insurmountably um, over the past five years and really, you know, expanded, you know, our business lines, you know, not only into different asset classes, different deal sizes, different capabilities. And in the process, we've built up a very large um, vertically integrated operating platform. Um, so in addition to just, you know, call it your being a typical acquisition shop, um, we have in-house property management, construction management, development, asset management, in-house leasing, you know, legal investor like relations reporting. Um, it's a full soup to nuts, you know, well-oiled machine uh, that we've been able to, uh, you know, build over here. Yeah, it's, it's just a, a really incredible operation. I, I just am so impressed with some of the major products you've worked on. So you have you had this, uh, you know, this personal relationship, you, you essentially pitched on the opportunity to be able to take things to the next level. Let's talk about, you know, maybe one or two of the, the big deals that you guys worked on together once you had joined. Uh, you know, I'm thinking Philadelphia, I'm thinking a couple, but maybe you could pick one and then uh, you could share a little bit more about what it was like to to really, you know, you know, play a real, real active role at that level, being able to uh, navigate some of these, uh, you know, stressful situations through like this sure. entire deal process. Yeah. So I guess the first one to start would probably be our acquisition of 1500 market in Philadelphia. That was in 2017, um, owned by Equity Commonwealth as part of what was their Philly portfolio strategy, which was to own, you know, Class A, Class A plus. Class A minus and a Class B um, office building. If you know 1500 Market, also known as, as Center Square in Philadelphia, it's effectively the GM building um, of Philly. You know, everyone there knows it. It's not the newest, you know, shiniest new construction tower, but it's their GM building. Um, it. When we acquired it, the rents were far below market, um, and it was a value add, you know, renovation play. Um, if you've been there, it has a absolutely massive three story lobby with mezzanine and a basement level. Um, it's 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 two office buildings, one point seven million square feet, um, two towers. Um, that was my first deal in Nightingale and still probably one of the most exciting ones just because of what we we're able to do to the building and really reposition and transform it. Um, it's, you know, as an office buyer, like I love going in situations where like I know I can improve it um, and I know I can make a difference where, you know, a tenant comes to us after we finish our lobby renovation and say, wow, this is absolutely incredible. Um, you guys, Put your money where your mouth is you guys have invested in invested you know in improving the building um that shows commitment by you as the owner and we're thinking about extending our lease early um so it's uh it doesn't go unnoticed um uh, when you do the right the right thing in this business that, yeah that's for sure i mean it's uh yeah, it must be extremely gratifying to be able to, you know, see like, hey, this is the feedback I'm getting. You know, you were able to see this for what it could be. I mean, I think it's amazing enough, you know, even just taking a blank canvas, like a new development and imagining what it could look like, that's that's one thing. But another level is you have something that already exists. Everybody is just so stuck in seeing it the way it is. But to be able to be seeing that in a new way, it really takes something, you know, and I'm just thinking about the kind of space you're in, 1.7 million square feet of office, okay? Now it's even, you know, crazier, you know, people are thinking like, you know, what are you going to do with that? But, you know, even a few years ago, people were, you know, still you hear the same things as you do with retail, like, ah, oh, what's the future look like, such and such. And so I'm curious, like, you know, what are some of the things that come up for you when you see that opportunity that maybe has other people say, you know, can't figure this one out, pass. And you say, ah, this is exactly what I think we could do something spectacular with. I'm curious a little bit about that, what comes up? So it's uh, a good question. Um, one thing I'm a firm believer in, and this was even pre-COVID, is there's always going to be a flight to quality. There's always going to be, unless you have a tenant that's looking for some, you know, back office call center operations that wants, you know, the best deal in the market. Sure. There's always going to be a flight to quality, and that was true pre-COVID, and COVID more or less proved that to be entirely 100% correct. Um, you know, it, it's really... I, I, I said it before, you know, putting, you know, your money where your mouth is and, you know, improving the quality that's, that's there, you know, that's, yeah. that's, what, that's what tenants want to see. And nine times out of 10, they're willing to pay the freight on that. Um, I see that all the time, especially um, in some of the, what I call class B product that 
you know, somebody thinks that they can go in there and do a light lobby or innovation, not touch any like another inch of the building, and they're like, oh well, I I spent you know five bucks a square foot here. Um, I'm gonna call this a class A building and, and command class A rents when I have tenants who are in place and they're 30 percent below market. Um, and they're like, all right, uh, you, you touch the lobby, but the elevator cabs are still 25 years old. Um, it, it's you know, like I said, truly one of the things where it. I don't want to say if you build it, they will come, but like if you, if you do the work and prove that you're doing the work, um, good things will, will certainly fall suit. Sure. I get that. Um, I think elevators are a good thing to touch. And I feel like that's a great go to, especially when you look at how technology has evolved over the last 10, 20 plus years. A lot of these buildings, they, they really benefit tremendously. And it's something that I feel like tenants just really appreciate. It's a much better experience. You know, you're getting in and out throughout the day multiple times a day. Um, what's like one or two things that you found, at least in Philly, and then maybe like, a, you know, maybe like if you have a playbook in your picture, these are things that we know make a big impact when we're doing our deep work in buildings. What, what was one in Philly that you found, uh, you know, really made a big impact? Um, so one thing, I guess, in Philly and nationally, and as an owner, this holds true everywhere in the country. Um, it's, it's certainly one of the things where when a tenant tours a building, the first thing they see is a, is a lobby entrance. The second, see that, the second thing they see is the actual lobby, and third, the elevators, before they even get to the space. You're already going to have renderings of the space. So if you're looking to improve something, it, you want to attack it from the point of view of what's my tenant going to see, and what's the first thing that they're going to see um, in the building, because you, know, you win or lose deals, um, and by deals, I mean leasing deals, based upon first appearances. Totally, totally. That's a great, uh, that's a great takeaway, that's a great insight. Um, talk a little bit about how you historically had financed a, a building like that, and then we'll kind of segue into some of these more creative things you've looked at, but you know, let's use that example. What, what did you typically look at as like a go-to scenario when it comes to your financing? Uh, so for financing, it really depends on the business plan, um, our partner, and really our whole period, and how quickly we think we're going we're to be able to, you know, enact that business plan. Yeah. Um, we've done everything from CMBS, CMBS six rate, CMBS floaters, um, SASB, um, you know, typical bridge financing debt funds where you know we're going to have to get a, put some sort of flinery bridge on it, you know, temporarily. But once we get to a certain hurdle that we can put on something a little bit more long term, we've also done. We've also done balance sheet. Yeah, um, we've done every type of debt you know under the sun. I always say like, look to tailor your debt to your you know your business plan, and always go go out with optionality. I, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to other owners or other borrowers that are like, I'm buying this deal. I only want to do CMBS financing because that's going to give me the best best rate and or the best rate for the highest amount of leverage. Um, that's probably true, you know, most most of the time. However, there could be that outlier debt fund that on that certain day, they're really bullish on this product and they can give you some sort of bridge solution with, you know, pretty favorable extension options, maybe at the same rate as a CMBS um, that could allow you to put on more, more attractive permanent financing, you know, in three to four years versus trying to get, call it, 80% of that financing that you want to put on it in the future. Um, so I, I always recommend, you know, think about optionality, you know, yeah. it, it never hurts to expand, you know, the you know universe of, of who you're trying to get financing from. I, I talk a lot about that. Um, I think best execution comes when you have more options, right? You know, when you're not locked into one option, you don't have that, um, you know, that feeling of like, uh, you know, the stress that comes with it, that you have to make that work when you know you have three to five options, there's there's a lot more freedom to be able to act in a way that is optimal and effective. So I, I, I love that you're saying that. Um, when it comes to how you actually do it, do you find uh, that you're oftentimes going to like a best in class advisor and you're having them really give you a bigger picture of who are the players and also making a market? How have you typically approached it? I would say every situation is different. Okay. Um, we always like to run a competitive process. Yeah. You know, certain situations, you know, we, we hire mortgage brokers, other situations, we, we, we've done a lot of deals with a lot of lenders over the years. Um, and we know who can execute, we know who's a good fit for the deal. We know who provides certainty of execution. Um, so it's really a, a case by case basis. Um, yeah. 
you know, some borrowers say they always want to go to their, you know, long-term, you know, relationship lender, and that's fine. Um, you know, that's 100% okay. Um, I always say try to make somewhat of a market to see if you can get the best, the best terms available. Um, but, you know, it really comes down to, you know, everyone's personal preference. I mean, I got to think that on a, on a very challenging office transition deal, that's where it probably makes the most sense to be able to have like an advisor that really is just, they're out there because you, you kind of need to make that market. This isn't like a, a, a no brainer deal, right? These are, these are things that really require the right framing, you know, sometimes looking to new sources that might not be as known, you know? And so I, I feel like in those scenarios, it really creates just another level of execution, having more options when you, when you yeah, no, you're, you're hundred percent correct on that note, especially, you know, it, you're right. The more transitional opportunity is, you know, the more you're going to need an advisor yeah. um, to really guide you and, and show you the market. I can also tell you, I, I have a close friend who's a hotel advisor and he said, you know, I had lunch with him yesterday. He said, ever since COVID, he said, there's been more new participants in the hotel lending market in the past 12 to 18 months than the past 10 years of his career. And he said he had a bunch of borrowers that say, only, only go to these three banks. And he's like, well, here are two dozen new shops that have all raised funds that are extremely competitive. Um, and he's doing new business with new banks with the same clients. Yeah. Um, so, you know, another benefit of, you know, going through a process is there's, you know, new players coming to this market, every, you know, every day because there's so much capital being raised. Um, and so much, so much of it's being deployed that, you know, I've, I've been in situations where the lenders are, are making loans at, at spreads that are a lot tighter than you think that they were going to do. And it's a function of they've raised capital, it needs to be deployed, um, and they really like the store in the situation, and they can allocate a good chunk of it into you know a certain property, um, and something that you thought was going to cost you three and a half percent now cost you know three percent, and that's pretty pretty mean, uh, pretty meaningful. Yeah, I mean I, I think that there's so much money that's and it's only continued that's flooding the U.S. commercial real estate markets, and. I, I, there's not the transparency that you have in other products like in equities. It's like you just don't know sometimes, especially as you're doing these more complex deals that we're talking about, that it's not like, you know, you, you go in the you know Google search and say, oh, what are the lenders doing for, uh, you know, a transitional 1.7 million square foot office building? I mean, you, you really need to create the market. And so I think that it just serves you. And to your point, there's just so many more players coming in the market. So many different people have different preferences. Some people are bullish on one asset class. Some people are bearish. I mean, you really need to to leverage the fact that you can't know everything. You got to lean on the right who, you know, the right people that that are just in the market constantly for certain things you're doing. So yeah, I think no, and, and, like, and on that note, you know, when you say that certain certain groups are bullish on one versus the other, you also have to think about allocation and timing. You know, everyone has a certain mandate that they need to get a certain, a certain amount of capital out the door by sure. you know, end of twenty one and the twenty two, um, and say they need to get you know half a billion dollars you know out by the end of 21 and they can't put more than five percent into any one asset class and they put they've already allocated everything to multifamily um already allocated they're already maxed on multifamily allocation or industrial exposure they're going to be really aggressive on office because that's pretty much the only loan that they can make for the rest of the year yeah yeah it's like you can't possibly know that if you're i mean if you're in the business of of really identifying good opportunities and then executing on a business plan, that's full time. <laughs> and then when you add the other leg of the stool to say, now I have to constantly know who's in the market, which allocations, you know, have people, you know, hot or not on different sectors. It just, it definitely to me seems like it's like a, a good practice to make sure you have the right people on your team, whether it be in-house or that you're working with uh, very strategically to be able to help you out with that. I think it's just such a, such a layer when you know how to be able to access smart capital. So let's let's use that as a segue into some uh, some innovative uh, capital solutions. So uh, so it looks like, you know, from what I could tell, I mean, we've had some good conversations about this already. You seem like you're constantly interested in just, you know, what's happening, what technology is being used, what's innovative. And so I'll, I'll put CPACE in that category as an innovative financial product. Um, most people still haven't even heard of it. Uh, you know, very few people have executed with it to date. 
uh, it's wild when you think about this as an industry. You know, I had been involved now for about four years. The industry has been around for 10 years. But realistically, I would say it's probably only been the last two and a half, three. You, you haven't even had these major markets active until recently. I mean, New York City, just with your deal, activated. Uh, Chicago was just not too long ago, I guess less than two years ago. And so it really is, it hasn't been the radar. The volume's been growing tremendously, but it's still coming from such a minimal amount annually that had been getting done. It was like, you know, five, six years ago, maybe in the tens of millions of that. And now you're starting to see exponential growth, but even exponential growth is still like maybe 200, 300 million as an industry, maybe 400 million. Uh, so there's a lot of room to grow. But tell me, tell me what, when did you first hear about CPAs? Uh, we've, we've had, we've, uh, had this conversation before. It's interesting. Uh, we first heard about CPAs probably 2016, 2017. Um, we were actually approached by a vendor in one of our Philadelphia properties when we were putting on, or we were installing a new boiler. Okay. And they told us that they have an interesting financing solution for the boiler. And at the time, we're like, all right, this is actually really cool. But for a $300 million loan, um, trying to convince our lender to, you know, allow this new innovative financing for $3 million of that $300 million loan, we thought at the time, we're like, that's not worth, you know, the headache and the brain damage involved in convincing somebody to do that. But we always had it in the back of our minds, like, this sounds really interesting and it definitely has the right place in the future we just need to learn more about it let, let me ask you a question on that note um did you know initially uh we're going to get pushback from a lender like so, so you have the group that's saying hey listen we could finance 100 percent of the cost of this three million boiler no problem kind of gave you a sense of the terms what so what happened from there were you like sounds great what's the catch or like how did you like you know what, what did you do from there i imagine you must have said that's interesting let's explore that Right. So tell me about how that happened. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a situation where we already had financing on the property. Yep. And we had no need to refinance it or try to work out something with our existing lender. But we had, you know, we asked for more details just to kind of understand how it worked. And, you know, we thought to ourselves, like on a much larger scale or on a scale where that C pace is a larger portion of the overall capital stack, this could be very interesting. You know, if 1% not, you know, 1% of the capital stack, not so interesting, but if talking 25, 30%, this could be extremely, extremely, you know, meaningful. Um, and so we always had in the back of our minds that there's this innovative product. We're be trying to learn more about it. Um, it's been around for a while, but trying to track down someone who's really like an expert in it. Um, uh, always had it in the back of our minds, you know, sure. trying to find the right fit for that in the future. And, and with regards to that project in Philly, were you like, let's just see if our lender would do it or you didn't get to that point? Did it did it occur? Or you're like, you know what? We don't even want to, like, you know, introduce it. We think it's like, like, did you know that, oh, there might be pushback or were you like, like, oh, like, well, I just don't know if it's worth it to bring it up. How how'd that happen? Uh, it was one of those. We were so far down the road of the business plan and yep. our boiler bits actually came in well under budget that were like, Got it. not worth going down that road. Um, yeah, but this is something that we definitely want to keep in the back of our minds. Sure, sure, understood. So you had it there. You, you know, maybe maybe you spent a little bit more time after that, find out a little bit more about the landscape. What were you hearing in the market about CPACE that was interesting? What was surprising to you about it? Give me a little bit of like, uh, you know, I imagine you're interested in financing that could be maybe cost effective, uh, maybe something that might be able to you know improve returns. What did you think in terms of? Okay, here's the challenges. Uh, here's the opportunity. What what came up for you? So, uh, I mean, the biggest challenge at the time was learning more about it. Um, okay. Because at the time, there had not been a whole lot of CPACE loans done. And sure. Yet, you know, it wasn't approved, you know, in as many states as it is today. Um, so the biggest challenge at the time was learning more about it, trying to understand where we can where we can use it. Um, what situation and what states. And everyone knows about local law 97 in New York. Um, and we thought to ourselves, we're like, there could be a, certainly a situation in the future where this this, this could really come in handy. Um, it just it needs to be a situation where that amount of CPAs is a meaningful portion of the capital stack because the way I explain it, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but 
that seed base is costing you five percent, whereas you know traditional support and financing is going to cost you you know double digits. Sure. Um, and if it's a large portion of the capital stack, that's extremely me- meaningful to you know the return to the equity. I, I think that's a great way to look at it. I, I feel like there's kind of been this challenge in terms of how it's to be perceived. Um, most bars, I, I feel like, are being told, "Hey, this could replace equity." And when you really dive into it, you know, you start to see like, hey, it's at this position as a tax lien and assessment. And so most lenders say, well, this has a priority. And, you know, you can make all the arguments, ah, you know, it's a, but it's a passive tax. But more often than not, I find that a lot of lenders look at it as something that's more senior. So they don't just look at it as replacing equity. However, to your argument, it's not really debt either, but yet it could replace out more expensive debt, right? So if you have a lender that's just more expensive than five and a quarter, uh, you know, I find that especially on these big projects that you guys are doing, uh, and we use this as an example, rather than having, you know, 100 million at like, you know, mid teens or low teens rate, maybe you have uh, 50 million and it could be both. Right. And it could still be able to, you know, take down your, your overall capital cost. So I, I do think that's a good way to use it. And I, I feel like there's going to be such an opportunity for those projects that, you know, that, that you guys are involved with where you could blend down because you are typically looking at. Uh, some higher cost options in that transitional time period. So I, I yeah, I mean it's a, it's certainly a very optimal solution. Yep. For a construction redevelopment development type of situation, if you're buying something that's triple net lease to Amazon for the next fifteen years, I don't really know how it's going to make sense, um, unless you can somehow get the get the cost of building that building, you know, to be included in C pace. But with that being said. You know the credit markets out there for you know for you know and a Amazon lease is so cheap anyways. It's not going to make sense, but it's certainly a tool that you're going to see a lot more developers using it um, yeah. all across the country. Yeah. So let's uh, let's kind of fast forward. So you were aware of it. You know, kind of had it on the back burner. You know, you know, working on some other big projects. So let's talk about how 111 got started, you know, flying the wall, you know, you get the call, this is, you're going to make a run at it. I initially was the leasehold, but let's talk a little bit about that, how that got started. I, you know, backing up a few years back, you know, I know initially came down the pike. What was that like when you first saw this deal and you guys, Hey, we're going to, we're going to take this on 1.1, 1.3 million square feet office building. That, Correct. Uh, right. Million. Vacant, <laughs> uh, you know, around the time you guys are going to acquire it. Right. So, 111 Wall Street was built in 1968 as a bill to suit for First National Bank, which was later acquired by Citibank. Um, it had been a bank building ever since it was built. Um, you know, late late 60s construction. And what's interesting about it, so in 1999 or 1990, 1999, um, Citibank, or not Citibank, Zurich, and the Zurich Insurance Company, um, did this massive sale and lease back with like 20 city bank buildings where city, you know, city owned them, they sold them to Zurich and then they leased it back for 20 years. They're all master leases. So hundred percent triple net, you know, zero landlord obligation. It was effectively as if city owned the building, even though, you know, they, they had to pay rent to somebody else. It, the, the leases worked effectively as like a self advertising mortgage. Um, so it had been at one point a extremely occupied city bank building. They moved everyone out um, to their headquarters at 390 Greenwich um, over the years, which is funny because when we were buying the building, we talked to our friends at City, and like everyone had done training in the building. Uh, they all knew it, yeah. Yeah, they all knew it very well. But the issue is because it was, you know, everyone knew it was, it was a city building, it wasn't on anyone's radar from a leasing perspective. And everyone knew that one day it was going to be vacant. Uh, we had the opportunity to acquire the leasehold interest um, from Zurich in 2019, um, which you know it was a, a big undertaking at the time. You know, even even pre-COVID, knowing that you're buying a building that is going to be vacant, you know, by the time you close. But nothing in downtown Manhattan had existed like that, um, especially at the price point that we were able to buy it for. That's what you have to keep in mind. We, we were able to buy it for, you know, we were able to buy the leasehold, I want to say, for like $200 a square foot. Um, yeah. And we knew we had to spend another $200 a square foot on it, but 
we we really like that that basis even as and, and just by comparison i mean a lot of people have a sense of what that is what's like today you know if you could even make it work a new office building at like what would you say that would look like? um i want to say 100 pearl is in contract to be sold for 900 a square foot even though yep. that's a redevelopment it's yep. effectively like not new construction but very it's considered very close to it and yeah yeah so 200 a foot even after doing like a massive upgrade another 200 you're still in an incredible basis correct still a, still 1.2 or 1.3 million square feet that you got to still say we got to figure out how to get this thing uh leased i mean it's unbelievable exactly it has these forty five thousand square foot like floor plates that yep. we really like and our leasing brokers really like because you know it, it can it's a great offering for, for a tenant um and so we closed on that in January of 2020. Um, we closed on the leasehold interest. The building was vacant. City vacated and their lease ended 30 days before we closed on it. So we closed on it when it was vacant. So tell me, tell me a little bit about the process that because that was also, I mean, a pretty big undertaking. I imagine to get financing for leasehold interest in the office building that was empty. What was that process like when you were out there in the market, and how'd that go over? Um, so at the time we were out for a pre-development loan because it naturally took, you know, six to 12 months to tee up our plans and permits, work with our architect on the renderings and, and the designs, you know, that, 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 that always takes, pro takes time as a process. Everyone thinks that like I can go hire an architect and they're going to have plans for the entire building and CDs done in like 90 days, which just isn't feasible. Um, we obtained a pre-development loan for our acquisition financing from SL Green. Um, great to work with. I want to say it was low leverage. Uh, it was 55% loan to cost. Yep. Um, great experience with the team over there. And then, you know, a few 30 days into, you know, our, our, our planning stage to, you know, work on our CDs and our, and our final design, COVID hit. Um, and so we had to go back to the drawing board and redesign everything. But in that process, right after we closed, we had a meeting with the fee owner at the time, um, more as an introductory meeting. Hey, you know, we're your new tenant. It's 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 nice to meet you. And and, and at, at the time, we'd been thinking about approaching them to do some sort of extension or upfront payment for more term because there was just about 50 years remaining on the leasehold from when we closed on it and 19 years until another f &B reset. And the prior f &B reset was in 2009. So it okay. reset at the height of GFC and it was a really good deal for the leasehold owner, not the best deal for the fee owner. Um, and so we had a launch, introductory, introductory launch to get the ball rolling. About were, you, were you there at the launch with Ellie? Uh, I was, I was not at the launch. Okay. Um, and on the way out, uh, I forgot if it was Ellie or Mike, Mike, Mike with, uh, Wofra had asked, or uh, I think it was Ellie said, if you're, if you're interested in selling the fee, we'd be more than happy to buy it. Uh, and the fee interest. Kind of, kind of like half joking a little bit. Yeah. Half joking. And the, like very interested, but like, I don't know if they'll go for it. Right. It, it was one of those, like telling yourself they're never going to say yes, but if, if you, you know, if you don't ask, if you don't ask, you don't get right. Exactly. And <laughs> we asked, I said, yes, that'd be something that we'd be, would be very interested in. Um, Amazing. And that was call it right a week or two after we closed. So still January of 20, you know, no, no thought of COVID really in sight. Um, and then we quickly signed a contract to acquire the fee position, collapsing both of them, um, which would, you know, before the cost of the renovation and TI and LC and carry all that, I want to say we would put us in at a basis of like 300 foot. So we went from 200 a foot leasehold to 300 foot fee simple. Amazing. Um, we, Amazing. Still, we still felt, felt that that was a really good deal. Um, and a few months go by, COVID hits, everyone's scrambling to try to figure out, you know, what's the best, you know, space plan for the building at the time because we have to drastically redesign, you know, the interior of the office building to take into account COVID and um, and the design modifications that we need to attract employees in, in this new post-COVID world. Um, as things were rapidly evolving in March, you know, April and May of, of 2020, uh, briefly explored doing some sort of multi family conversion didn't quite work because the floor plates were just too large and um, 
it just it would not have been a very efficient uh, multifamily building. Uh, you know, move forward with our, our final design. Um, you know, for the call it post COVID modification, and then needed to um, get financing because not only do we, do we have to close on the fee, which we never thought we we're going to be able to do by collapsing the fee in the leasehold. It was like one of the things where like never thought you're going to be able to pull off almost too good to be true. And now you kind of have a gun to your head and you need, we need to get financing for it. Sure. At the same time, our, you know, our construction docs were done. Um, and we also needed a construction loan. Um, we went out for our financing in September of 2020 when if, if you know, New York city capital markets, they were more or less Crazy. Oh, God, yeah. for, you know, call it speculative office, speculative office. September, 2020 was, around the date that a lot of companies said that they were going to be bringing people back to the office and then they delayed it for a whole year. Um, and it's interesting to see, or at the, at the time, how responsive a lot of lenders out there were just to work from home plans. It was, Oh, we're interested in this. Oh, XYZ company is pushing their return to office date back, you know, 12 months, you know, this isn't going to be for us. Um, and so we, you know, attempted to get, you know, our, our financing at a very interesting time in the capital markets. Um, and we, we knew it was going to be a challenge uh, going into it was going to be a challenge. And then I, you know, I had the idea randomly. Um, I was like, why don't we think about C-Pace here? Because one of the inter interesting things that one of our MEP engineers told us is like, Hey, your utility bill is going to go down like 75%, like once you're done with, with the renovation, because this is a extremely energy inefficient building. Yeah. You said uh, it was built in the sixties or when was yeah, it? it? I mean, think about that. It's when you, 75%. It's almost like, really? Is that, I mean, you know, I hear like 30, 40% in some cases when you do some of this deep work, but I mean, I, I'm sure you hear that number and it's like, wow, like this is really interesting. Yeah. And we're like, all right, that's a big enough number that like we should order a report and study and understand like what exactly that means. Because like, that's very meaningful to the value of the building and also sure. the offering to our tenants. Um, and so we knew what CPACE was. We weren't experts on it at the time. Then our partners at Wafra was familiar with the CPACE lender um, that they looked at doing business with, you know, a number of years ago. And they, I think admittedly said like, we don't know enough about this quite yet. Um, and that was, that was, that was Petros in Austin. Yep. So we called Petros and we said, we're doing this massive, you know, fee acquisition plus construction, construction loan. Um, we think we want to do C pace here. Don't know enough about it. You know, what do we need to do in order to, uh, you know, see if this is feasible here. And they said, well, it's not approved in New York. It should be soon. First thing you need, you need to do is order a engineering report so we can tell you. Um, how large a sea base you can put you can put on the property. We thought we were gonna get you know twenty, thirty million dollars of sea pays. Engineering report came back, it said we qualified for like upwards of almost ninety million dollars of sea pays. Um, then, then the next question was what kind of rate, you know, is that ninety million dollars gonna come at? We thought it was gonna be like 14, 15 percent. And I wanna say our spread ended up being, you know, sub five percent. Um, and we're we're blown away because if you look at the size of the loan that we're trying to get, you know, that sluggish C pace is almost 20%. Yeah. Um, and so then we actually pivoted and went back out to the capital markets and said, we have 90% of the capital, or we have a $90 million slug of the capital stack. It's going to be C pace. Um, you, you know, as a lender, if you want to provide a whole loan solution as part of the C pace, um, you more or less need to be, need to become comfortable with it. A lot of, a lot of groups dropped out because, they just weren't educated on CPACE. They didn't know what it was. Um, a lot of a lot of firms thought CPACE was a new form of EV5. They thought mm. it was kind of green energy EV5. We're like, no, no, that's that is not what it is. And it was really an educational process. Um, to was it was it you educating them? Like, tell me a little bit about what that looked like, because I find that is that is the thing that needs to be done. Is anything new? It's education. And then it's first getting the attention to even have that audience. I think you guys had the the background, the reputation to get that attention, but then to have that engagement and have people look at this, which they didn't really have a, a playbook for. It was like a new product. How, how'd that come about? Like who was involved in those conversations? I know at one point we also talked about uh, part of the lender consortium played a real role, but what was that like? And 
tell me some of the conversations that came up early. They so they said it's a green EB five. That was one thing that came up. What are other things that came up? That was one of the questions from one of the lenders who passed on it. They thought it was green EB five financing. Um, and Which means what, right? I mean, I don't know. You know, a lot of it was you know inner creditors saying stand still and and you know subordination. What exactly is it? Is is it you know? Met, cheap mez with less teeth is it yep. super seniors you know that's more expensive in reality as we all know it's just a tax assessment um but you, you know i explain it as you know less hairy or cheap mez with less teeth there's no cc um it's not a mortgage it's effectively um, a tax assessment um it was really just a kind of open book conversation on what is this? And, you know, as a lender, you know, you know, how do I, how can I get screwed? You know, how does it work for me? Um, and it really kind of came down to, a, you know, a private debt fund who didn't really have the typical bank regulations that were willing to have an open mind, um, an open mind to educate themselves on what exactly CPACE was. Um, and that's kind of how the lender consortium kind of came about with one lender who spoke for the whole loan with, CPAs be involved and then bringing other lenders in, into the capital stack. Um, and then as they brought in the capital stack, it was an educational process on really explaining what it was. Um, I'd say the business folks or the, yeah, the, the loan originators were probably the first ones to really understand what it was and how it worked. Sure. Makes um, sense. The largest educational process, I'd probably say going through the ringer on it, um, uh, was probably from a lot of the lawyers involved. Because Jeez. what was what was the what was the conference call like? How many how many attorneys were on some of those conference calls? Um, well, when you have you know multiple lenders, on four campus. four sets of lenders. Or was it four or five? Uh, four, I believe. Four lenders, lower council, and CPAs. And and CPAs. Uh, Forty people on a call. It it was it was very complicated. Um, I, I wow. can tell you there was there was more offline calls with lawyers talking directly with you know petros just yeah. walking them through what exactly everything is um it's it's, it's the lawyers who need to cross the t's and dot the i's um who no offense to them i hate to say they're kind of stuck in their own way you know it's a new thing it's a new product you yeah. have to really be able to make sure everything is vetted out so i get it and it, it, it was great r d work you did frankly yeah and the, <laughs> the biggest challenge at the time was CPACE wasn't approved in New York. Sure. Um, it was on the one inch line waiting from a stamp of approval from the mayor. Yep. Um, so all of, our, all, all of our loan docs were done. We we're kind of hanging out for, I forgot, 15, 30 days. Wow. We get to see Everyone just waiting, right? I mean, geez. Yeah. Uh, while, while COVID is happening, and that's the priority. So being like, hey, could you give us some attention to just move this forward, right? It's like, yeah. And oh you know, it, it was a great team effort from literally everyone involved. Sure. Um, to, you know, educate themselves on this new innovative, you know, product or portion of the capital stack that yep. most most people didn't know existed. Um, everyone approached it with, with an open mind. I think that was part of it. You know, there was lenders out there who just didn't want to learn about it. Um, they've been making loans a certain way, not really open to certain structures, and it was a non-starter for them. Um, but like as a lender, you know, it, I, I always tell you know lenders who I speak with, you know, if you if you can become you know educated on it and learn how to use it in your capital stack when you're offering whole loan solutions to borrowers, you can become extremely competitive and win deals that you otherwise probably normally couldn't do. Um, well, yeah, what I, I mean, tell you, is that is, accurate? Yeah probably the biggest impact that we didn't have the foresight to you know recognize at the time was more from the leasing community um as i briefly alluded to um you know even like right after we closed it was all in the headlines um you know first seat base in new york you know 89 90 million dollars um our lease brokers came to us and they said we're getting you know requests from tenants and rfps that we never thought would be looking at downtown office. Granted, you know, we're effectively delivering, you know, class A quasi new construction product um, at a fraction of class A rents. Um, all of a sudden, all these tenants came out of the woodworks and they were extremely interested in the building because of the CPAS loan. Because now there's all these Fortune 500 companies that have these 
you know, ESG requirements, which they're all very good, you know, carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and it's very difficult for a lot of these Fortune 500 companies to find certain buildings um, and markets where they want to be in that, yep. that that can provide that, you know, carbon neutral, you know, or carbon negative, if you want to call it, um, offering um, by the time, you know, they have to meet their mandate. And let me let me stick with that for a second because it, it's such a big point. So I was, I was at this event last week, uh, the one I just mentioned at the top of the hour uh, with Commercial Observer. The, one really great panel, it was uh, the Fifth Wall guy, uh, Brad Gruy, one of the co-founders. They're probably one of the biggest prop tech companies in terms of funding. And he was talking about what he's all in on, climate tech, right? And they were talking about, uh, there was a question that came up around what's going to lead to more and more of this movement in decarbonization. And it was the idea that regulatory pressure, you know, having more of these local laws, uh, you know, like in New York City, local law 97 and others. But then it came up that it's actually not even as much regulatory pressure as the pressure from the companies that are mandating it and saying, listen, we can't have you in our comp set unless you have that right ESG strategy. Otherwise, you just, you know, you're not going to be relevant for us. So I think all the tech companies are really going to move this. Any company that's looking at where my building is going to be, you know, if I'm going to be in a New York City or Chicago or Miami, any market, you have to have an ESG strategy to your point. Otherwise, you're not in the comp set. I mean, that's the pressure in my you opinion. You are 100% correct. Um, we, we recently worked with a, call it Fortune 10 um, tech company that we're very close with, and they're looking for office space, and they have extremely strict requirements, um, not because of who they are, but because of their ESG mandate that yep. they need to meet. Um, and they're willing to pay the freight, but you know, it needs to be an extremely energy efficient building. Um, and, you know, as a borrower, you know, I'm a firm believer that, like, if you spend the money on ESG compliance on, and in, making a more green building, um, the rents will eventually follow suit. Right now we're, you know, coming out of this post-COVID recovery, um, but that kind of, that still kind of plays into the whole, you know, flight to quality argument. Um, you know, ESG used to be the, the, the check the box item. Now it's a, uh, this is a requirement. And yeah. that's, one of the first questions that tenants are asking on RFPs when when they say, "Hey, we're coming to the market. We need fifty thousand square feet." Uh, they ask, land, you know, ten landlords for an RFP. You know, first or second page, other than um, the term of the lease and the size, is you know the ESG compliance of your building. That is fascinating. That's that's reality right now. Yeah, and it's yeah. interesting. It's like the leasing brokers are becoming more educated and experts on it when they said like. Out of necessity, I've had to ask everyone internally, um, our our own ESG people, to like educate the, the the brokerage teams on, you know, how do I, you know, guide you know my tenants or guide guide my you know clients. It's it's a ESG is a macro theme, right? So you could you could differentiate if you're a lender to say we're going to be you know ESG friendly, and one of the ways we do that is with tools like Pace. You could do that as a leasing broker to say we really get this and we know how to be able to tailor to the clients that need this and demand it. I mean. You could do it across the board as a landlord in your position. You know, I feel like you guys are really differentiating. I, I love what, I'll just share one of this because I know we're kind of wrapping up a little bit the hour, but uh, you, you're putting some really amazing technology into the building. One that I, I was already familiar with these guys for several years, just being in the CPA space for a little bit, but but view smart glass technology to me is just mind blowing. And to see what they're doing now with some of the display technology, talk about like a shiny object. You know, I, I was seeing some of the press, like, you know, Google sharing about, you know, what they're doing with the, uh, you know, St. John's, uh, you know, building and, you know, being able to see that in action. It's so cool. I, I highly recommend everybody type in view smart glass when you have a chance and, and look at one of the videos that just shows what the technology looks like. But, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, what you guys are doing in the building. Maybe you could highlight that, but I'm sure that's drawing a lot of interest as well. Right. Yes. Um, so I'm not going to explain it correctly, but View Smart Glass is the latest and greatest technology uh, in the glass arena. Um, and it is a extreme energy efficient measure that you can take for a building. It automatically tents. Um, so you, you go by your standard office building in Midtown, you know, some of the shades are up, some of the shades are down. At night, it's not the best looking product. Um, in the View Smart Glass building, you don't need shades because the windows automatically tent. There, it's not metaverse technology, but it's smart enough technology that it can react to the temperature inside or outside where the sun is shining um, 
so it will automatically tent, tent. So, so you, so your building becomes more energy, you know, efficient. You don't have to worry about, you know, turning on the, the HVAC or turning it off. Um, it, it's a, it's a extreme efficient efficiency measure, um, that I personally think is going to be, you know, the future of new construction office buildings. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things where like, until you see a sample of it, you know, you, the videos are cool, but like once you see a sample of it, like you're, you're completely sold on it. I know I gotta um, see it. I I, I I have a buddy who's been with the shop for a while, and I'm like, I gotta see it. You know, you know, my, myself because I see the videos, and I'm like, this is mind blowing. And I think to your point, like it's like if you have an existing building, I mean that stands out. I mean even if you have a new building, you typically don't have that technology because it's brand new. So you have now this other way to pull people because people like that. That's that's real cutting edge. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, when, when did you guys think that to put that in? I'm curious. When did that come up in the uh, business plan? Um, I want to say probably after COVID, okay. um, we, we had to like kind of, we had to redesign a lot of the building, uh, to account for it. You know, the videos that they have of, of the windows don't really do it justice. You got to see it firsthand, but it has, you know, amazing technology where, you know, you can have view smart glass, um, and in your conference room and it can effectively turn into a TV screen yeah. or, or video board. Uh, which is so so futurish. I mean, it's incredible when you see it. You really think it's like a sci-fi thing. You know, you really picture like you're in this conference space and now you're projecting on the walls. It's incredible. Yeah, it's really something. It uh, it it, it really is. Um, that I I would say that's probably the biggest component of the C pace. Um, was we're we're making a ton of improvements to the building, but probably from you know the facade slash window you know replacement that we're doing there. Yeah, it's a big ticket item. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it'll translate. I mean, I think also it gives you so much, uh, the, the press, you know, what you've got from CPACE, but also with that, I think it draws so much. It's like attention is such a currency and you're basically getting free marketing for people that are just geeking out over all the stuff that you're doing from the view smart technology, CPACE. I just think it attracts incredible attention. I'm sure you're seeing it firsthand. It's like, I was asking you, how many, how many calls do you get a day on, uh, on the project? It's probably like a pretty significant volume. It's, it's a lot, you know, most of it's from other owners who want to know more about the view, want to know more about the CPAs and yeah. how it can work for them. Yeah. So we're kind of wrapping this up. I'll just kind of leave. I want to just kind of wrap up with a couple of questions. Biggest thing, more than anything, you guys really, I think you went from zero to one, you know, having that one case study now in the city with your project. And I think that's going to be where you see more and more attention for CPAs. I'm sure you got some in the works as well. I'm sure there's some lenders you're having conversations with and letting them know like, hey, this is what we just did. We're just going to be looking for more of it. What are the conversations looking like? If you're talking to lenders right now, some are tuning in, what else could you tell them other than you're going to stand out in the market in, in a really uh, busy space? How should they be looking at CPACE? Um, how should they be looking at CPACE? Um, I mean, like the best way to explain it is because it's a lower cost of capital than what would ordinarily probably be in that portion of the capital stack. It's healthier for the overall deal, um, especially on a non-cash flowing or lightly cash flowing construction deal um, or redevelopment deal where there's some sort of interest in carry reserve. Having the CPACE and capital stack certainly lowers the overall basis. and. Yeah that's both good for the borrower in good situations and good for the lender in a bad situation. Um, Absolutely. You know, I, I always encourage, you know, lenders to, you know, ask themselves internally or ask their credit committees, you know, how we, how we can best use this, you know, in our offerings. Um, because the first step is education, really knowing what it is. Sure. And I, like, I think that's such a good point yeah, to, to like, just touch on that. There's, there's so much R and D in the prop tech space, in the innovative financing product space. I, I think the stat I heard, uh, this was also at the conference, over 30 billion went into the prop tech R and D. Talk to people, talk to Vue, talk to a CPACE provider, find out what's actually happening because there's so much investment in dollars and showing how you could be able to do unique things. A lot of a lot of building owners, it's like you're so bu- you know busy with so many things already. Leverage folks that are really deep in this space. I think that's just it serves you. So yeah. You're 100% correct. Awesome. So I asked a question at the beginning of the hour, and it's uh, it's really interesting. I want to get your take on it. You guys are so deep in this office space, and you've done some incredible projects. What's the future hold for office right now? What are some of the things you see happening over the next couple of years? So for starters, 
I think we can all agree there's certainly going to be more flexibility. Um, you know, I, I do think this is, this could be my personal opinion because this is somewhat self-serving, but like, I think a lot of this work from home is going to trickle away or trickle back. I think a lot of companies are being a lot more flexible to individual situations and, you know, solutions wanting and needing to have flexibility. Um, I, I still think the long term the future is office space. I mean, I, I make this analogy. You think, you know, Steve Jobs and Apple could have designed the first iPhone, you know, on a Zoom camera working from home. No, I'm sure they're in a, in a conference room. Working you got to be in a garage or a conference room. Or in a garage. Well, that, that's where the company was founded, but I'm, I'm sure uh, the iPhone is founded in a much nicer setting. Um, by being in the office, you know, collaborating, working together as a team, seeing everyone's personal reaction and emotions to everything. Um, you know, I do think in the short term, companies are going to be looking for more hybrid and flex solutions as they figure out how to bring everyone back in a safe and comfortable manner. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I still, I'm still, you know, I'm a long term believer in office, um, you know, especially you know, higher quality. It's it's one of the things where like you want your employees to be proud to be going to a certain building and wanting to hang out together in a certain building, whether it's socially or professionally. Um, so I I think, you know, the the office asset class is obviously experiencing some disruption as a function of COVID. Um, but I'm extremely bullish on it, you know, rightfully so, uh, you know, on a long term basis. Yeah. I think it's going to continue to evolve. And as we were talking about earlier, there, there's no uh, retail apocalypse. It's evolving just like the office is evolving. It's going to be both. It's going to be flexible. And I think there's a tremendous future for it to see uh, how more and more tech is being incorporated to make it uh, just absolutely spectacular. So, well, thank you, man. This is a great, uh, yeah. really great conversation. I really appreciate you sharing all your insights. You know, you have such great in the trenches experience and I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, real pleasure. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the C-Pace Confidential. Give this episode a like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the fast coming opportunities in the world of C-Pace. Got a question? Message us on LinkedIn at Adam Harris Lipkin. See you next time for another edition of the C-Pace Confidential.